thank you so much. Welcome everybody uh, to the community meeting for 770 and 805 Don Mills. Uh, before we start the meeting, I'd like to give um, land acknowledgement. I am honored to give this land acknowledgement on behalf of CREATEO and the City of Toronto because it is one way um, that settler descendants can offer proper respect as allies and supporters of Indigenous peoples on Turtle Island. I offer um, and uh, give this land acknowledgement as an immigrant and as a person who uh, hasn't had a privilege to know the land of my own ancestors. I'm ethnically Korean, but uh, three generations of my family uh, was born and lived in uh, back then Soviet space. Um, and we immigrated here uh, in early 2000s. We bring this uh, personal stories uh, to the land acknowledgement because it helps us remember and be mindful of all the treaties that exist in this place today and of all the people that lived on this land long before us. 770 Dawn Mills um, and 805 Dawn Mills Road um, sites um, as part of Toronto are the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the Haudenosaunee, the uh, Wendat, the Chippewa, and the Anishinaabeg peoples. Uh, we are, they're covered by Treaty 13 uh, that was signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and by the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. And of course, uh, we know now Toronto is a home to many diverse First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities. Um, so wherever you're tuning in uh, to this meeting from today, we encourage you to learn more about people indigenous to the lands that you're on. And with that, I'd like to turn over to uh, the councillor and deputy mayor, Denzel Minan Wong, uh, for opening remarks. Councillor, over to you. Hi, um, good afternoon. And I just wanna thank everyone for attending and all, <clears throat> all the work that um, staff have done, but, to, but um, particularly to the, lo the local residents. Um, this, is a, this is your community. Um, the city owns these two pieces of land. Um, we are developing those properties with some pretty interesting things on it. Um, the, that, the intersection of Don Mills and Eglinton is, is turning into a transit hub with the Eglinton LRT um, and the new Ontario line. So it, it, it's, it's really exciting. I mean, we're this, um, the only uh, um, transit hubs that I know of right now are Bluer and Young and uh, Eglinton and Young. This will be the, the third transit hub, I think. And so this will be a really important place. It's gonna be a, um, a, a real uh, marquee location uh, where um, it's, gonna be a, it's gonna be a place people are gonna to wanna to come to. So um, these two sites are very prominent because they're right in the middle of um, this transit hub. And uh, we've got some pretty exciting things or the city does that it wants to uh, present to you today in terms of what it wants to do, but um, it, it will have an impact on the local neighborhood. Um, and this, uh, the invitation uh, specifically went to the people in the neighborhood so that we can get, so we can inform you about uh, what's going on and uh, get your feedback in terms of what you think of the proposal um, and just start a dialogue uh, and a relationship um, about this property, about how, you know, the things that we may have missed some of the things that um, uh, we could do better. And by we, I, see, I say Create TO. Create TO is, um, is our development arm at the city. And this public meeting is, is um, like, like uh, so it, it's kind of like a development application, but a little bit different to the extent that um, in most circumstances, when a developer develops land, um, uh, there's a public meeting where the private developer makes a presentation and then there's a rezoning application. In this case, the city's um, the developer, we're the so-called applicant. And so this is a similar ar arrangement where we're gonna have a discussion with you or Create TO is as the applicant. And uh, they're gonna tell you what their plans are. And then we're gonna start discussing uh, and after, we pr after the pr proposal is presented, discussing with you and having a dialogue with you about what you think about this proposal and um, uh, uh, the staff are gonna present what the next steps are, but we hope to 
get this property rezoned and and developed. Um, and it's pretty interesting. It's a pretty exciting um, application where we've got a lot of community benefits uh, that, that they're going to go through, including a brand new school that we've given um, we we've given uh, space for. I know school the schools are uh, are overcrowded and we need more schools in the area and especially with the additional development we're going to need the schools there's daycare there's going to be a daycare there's going to be community space there's going to be open space and park space and um so this this will be pretty uh, pretty interesting stuff um and so uh, with that i look forward to hearing from the residents and uh and i look forward to uh hearing your comments and uh, moving forward so th with that, I'll pass it back to the chair and um, I look forward to the questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so let's start with a very quick round of introductions, just so that everybody knows uh, who uh, will be presenting today and answering uh, most of the questions. That being said, I just want to acknowledge right away that uh, this is not the whole team. There are actually a lot more members uh, who are in the audience today um, supporting and working hard to make this project happen. So um, let's start with Creatio. I'll just uh, call out your name and maybe you can wave so participants can see who you are. Um, so from Creatio, we have Jason Chan. From uh, City Planning, we have Annalise Unina and Michelle Corcoran. Michelle, uh, from Housing Secretariat, we have Valesa Faria. From Montgomery System, we have Kevin Hutchinson. From the Planning Partnership, we have Wayne De Giorgio. Um, and uh, we have a few members of the facilitation team today. Matthew is helping us uh, with technology around this meeting on the back end. And we have Ian and Ruth who will be taking lots of notes today. So um, Ian and Ruth, if you need to um, stop to make sure that we are capturing everything um, correctly and accurately, let me know, raise your hand. And my name is Yulia. So uh, my team, my colleagues and I, we are part of the independent third party facilitation team, which means that we don't have any vested interest in any particular outcome of this project. So rather our role um, on this project today is to help facilitate the discussion and to help document what is shared um, publicly today for the public record. So uh, you will see us taking lots of notes, as I said, and Ian and Ruth are here to support me. Another important thing about um, our role and our team in general is that we only work with governments and um, on government projects. And through our work, we know that dissent and different differing opinions are very important for the public discussions, especially when it comes to discussing um, how to best invest public assets to address public policy priorities, uh, which you know we're doing today. And we know that for many differing opinions to emerge, it's important that we all collectively participate in a way that's respectful of one another, of others, and that's constructive. And so we developed meeting guidelines to help us create and maintain that environment. If you joined us a little bit early, you've seen it, seen the meeting guidelines on a slide, but for the benefit of everyone joining us online and on the phone, I'd like to um, reiterate them. So um, we are here today to hear from um, anyone who would like to share their uh, thoughts and perspectives with us um, in a respectful way. And community meetings are supposed to be spaces where everyone can listen to each other, learn from each other, and share with each other. Um, and so it's important to be mindful of the language we use and how we share our comments. In this meeting, any hostile, derogatory, or negative comments that are targeting um, a specific individual or a group of individuals or specific communities will not be tolerated. Any such comments will result in a warning from uh, me um, and the team. And if the warning is not sufficient and uh, co sharing comments in such a way continues, then we'll mute the participant and the participant will be able to stay and listen, but will not be able to share their comments moving forward. Just wanted to make it clear right up front because I think it's important that we all collectively take responsibility for creating an environment that's respectful and conducive 
for many to share their perspectives with us. Also, we want to make sure that we get to as many people as possible and go through as many comments as possible today. So we ask everyone, including team members and participants to be as concise as possible um, and to keep your comments, questions, answers um, under two minutes. And I'll be gently reminding everyone as we flow through the meeting. So um, just to reiterate, what you can expect from the facilitation team is that we'll do our best uh, to steer um, and steward a constructive discussion following the meeting guidelines. What you can expect from CREATIO and city staff and the counselor is that we'll, they'll do their best to provide you with a clear answer. And if more details are needed, they'll follow up after the meeting. Um, and what we expect of all participants is remembering that this is a public forum for many different opinions to be shared. Um, so be mindful of your language. Uh, let's all uh, do our best to create a respectful environment where we can share our thoughts constructively with each other. Uh, one last thing is I want to note that this meeting is being recorded and will be available on the project website um, for public viewing after the meeting, along with other meeting materials, including the presentation and the meeting summary and the feedback form. Um, so with that, uh, what we have planned today, we have just under two hours together. We will start with a presentation uh, from um, the Housing Secretariat, City Planning, Creative and their consultants. We will talk about um, the Housing Now program in general, which is a big part of why we're here, and also review the new housing, including affordable housing, new streets that are being proposed, uh, new parks, new public spaces, as well as new communities, new community facilities and amenities. And uh, the presentation will not take more than 45 minutes, hopefully 40 to 45. Um, and the rest of the time we will use for um, facilitated questions and answers, and we'll cover how we can participate um, online today when the time comes. But as we jump into the presentation, I'd just like to um, ask everybody, as you listen, think about if there's anything in particular that really stands out to you that you like from what is being presented, but it's helpful for us to know. Um, if you have any concerns and if you have any suggestions on how to best address those concerns, we'd also love to hear that. And of course, if you have any other comments, questions or feedback, we'll be happy um, to, take, to take it as well. Um, I think that's it from me, um, and uh, without further ado, let's jump into the presentation. Uh, so, Valesa, over to you. Thank you, Yulia, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, before we get into the specifics of the Housing Now program, um, I think it's really important for us to provide you with some context on the, the, the Toronto housing context, um, as well as um, some details in terms of what the city is doing to address um, our current housing needs. So over the past decade, housing costs have grown faster than incomes in our city. In fact, between, 20, sorry, between 2006 and 2018, the price of housing grew by about 130%, while household median income grew by only about 30%. Um, there's a shortage of purpose-built affordable rental supply in our city. In fact, 90% of the purpose-built rental supply in our city was built before the 1980s. Um, currently, about 194,000 households pay more than 50% of their income on rents. Uh, there's a need to respond to pent-up housing demand while preparing for significant increased demand over the next nine years, and that's specifically um, due to an increase of about a hundred uh, million people um, coming into our city. The number of seniors aged 65 and over will grow by about 59% by 2030. The demand for supportive housing, which is deeply affordable housing with support services, will also grow faster than the population. And about 500,000 people will live in low income households by 2030. So Toronto City Council um, has approved a number of programs to help with the current housing uh, challenges in our city. So at the end of 2019, City Council approved the Housing Teal 2020-2030 Action Plan. So this is a, a robust 10-year plan. It's the city's 
so it's Canada's first human rights based plan. Um, and it's really focused on providing housing across the full continuum. So starting from emergency shelters all the way to home ownership. So and in between there is um, affordable rental housing, affordable home ownership and market rental housing, which will be delivered through the Housing Now initiative. So the 10 year housing plan, as mentioned, it's a robust plan. Um, there are a number of strategies, um, specifically 13 big strategies and about 76 actions that the city um, intends to address to meet the housing needs of about 341,000 households in our city by 2030. I'll not go over the entire list, but some of the main strategies to be addressed through the delivery of this housing plan include um, revitalization of neighborhoods, so creating um, a range of housing for a range of needs in all wards across our city. Um, we are also focused on helping residents um, to maintain and increase access to affordable rents and helping people to um, live in well-maintained and secure homes. So while the housing situation was challenging before COVID, um, it has been, um, these challenges have certainly been exacerbated as a result of COVID. So what we have seen is there's a considerable strain right now on the city's emergency shelter system. Um, in our city, there are about 7,800 people who are experiencing homelessness every night. Um, there is also a need for more um, affordable rental housing options in our city due to job losses and employment uncertainty um, as a direct result of COVID. Um, currently, there are an estimated 35,000 households in our city who are in rental arrears. So we really see here the need to increase a range of housing, um, including affordable rental housing. And despite these challenges, the Toronto housing market has remained resilient and um, has continued to see price growth. So as mentioned, um, the city has a robust 10 year housing plan. Uh, the Housing Now program that's the subject of tonight's meeting is one of the key strategies to deliver on that housing plan. And I'll pass, I'll pass it over now to my colleague, Annalie Zuneda, who will walk you through this uh, major initiative. Thank you very much, Valessa. So a bit about Housing Now itself. On the screen, you see a map of the city of Toronto and what you see are 17 circles representing the locations that council has approved for new housing now sites. And as Valesa mentioned, this is one of the key responses to the city's housing crisis, using city owned land near transit to advance the construction of new affordable housing. Uh, we've highlighted the two sites at 770 and 805 Don Mills Road. These are some of the larger projects in the Housing Now portfolio, uh, and they range from small buildings to entire new communities. Valesa showed you this graphic um, and mentioned that Housing Now fell, fell into uh, one of the types of affordable housing options that the city has at its fingers. And um, this is the overall spectrum of housing affordability. So what the sites you'll see today include are uh, new affordable housing that is rental, uh, new market rental housing, and uh, because these sites are large enough, a component of new home ownership units. A lot of people ask us uh, who can afford to live in this housing that you are proposing to build in these locations and what this slide shows are four individuals uh, who are representative of people who are working and living in the city of Toronto uh, who are facing uh, challenges regarding the city's affordability crisis. So we have people who are working, for example, as early childhood educators, as nurses, people in the construction industry, or people who are maybe retired. And because of the price of housing in the city of Toronto today, these people may be paying between 37 and 83% of their income on rent. A little bit about 770-805 Don Mills Road, which we presented by my colleague. Um, oh, this is still me, pardon me. Um, 
So how we're going to do 805 and 770 Don Mills Road, um, we're here with you tonight uh, in the yellow, uh, the yellow arrow, stage two, talking about a development concept. But what we'd like to share with you tonight is some of you may remember that over the years of 2016 to 2019, uh, city planning was out in the community over 20 times working on the vision and design for the Don Mills Crossing secondary plan. And this was a plan to address the new growth and intensification that would take place at the intersection of Don Mills Road in Eglinton, uh, and we had over 1,100 people attend those meetings. Um, because we were including uh, density and new development concepts in that program, we have, are now with you tonight to look at something a little that's in a little more detail that will inform the submission for the zoning bylaw that will permit the two uh, the uh, the development on the two addresses you see today. Following that, Create TO and the City of Toronto will lead a market offering and uh, the construction and delivery of the housing. So your feedback is extremely important, and in fact, it was a critical part of the development of the Don Mills Crossing secondary plan. Um, so thank you for everyone who participated in that. As you're hearing feedback tonight, and as you're looking at the designs you see before you, please keep in mind that we hear from the local community and feedback from the local community does a lot to shape the designs that we see. Um, we also, uh, on Housing Now files, have to look at the fact that Council has uh, directed that we look to optimize the number of new affordable housing units on the site, um, how the existing planning policy informs what can be built in these locations, uh, feedback from the City's design review panel, uh, and feasibility of the development concept, among others. So I will now pass it over to my colleague, Michelle, to take you through the site and the area. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Corcoran, and I'm the community planner that's assigned to these applications. And I'm going to take us through the site and area context and the planning policy framework. So the sites are located at the southeast and southwest corners of Don Mills Road and Eglinton Avenue East. This here is an aerial view of the intersection looking north. The sites are highlighted in yellow with 770 Don Mills to the left of the screen and 805 Don Mills to the right of the screen. Abutting 770 Don Mills in the southwest quadrant of Don Mills and Eglinton is E.T. Seton Park and the Ontario Science Centre. North of 770 Don Mills in the northwest quadrant is the redevelopment of the former Celestica lands, which has been approved for roughly 5,000 residential units, as well as several non-residential uses, including office, a community recreation centre, a long-term care facility, and multiple daycares. Abutting the site, abutting 805 Don Mills in the southeast quadrant is the recently approved Sonic residential development, another residential tower, and the Forester's office building. Beyond this area is the mixed-use neighborhood of Flemington Park. North of 805 Don Mills in the northeast quadrant is the existing Real Canadian Superstore grocery store, as well as the future TTC bus station, which is currently under construction. And um, also highlighted here is the location of the Science Center LRT station entrance at the southwest corner of Don Mills and Eglinton. So this slide shows a zoomed in aerial of the same area, but now we're looking south. Um, both sites have similar lot frontages along Eglinton at about 250 to 275 meters. And again, we can see where E.T. Seton Park and the Science Center abut 770 Don Mills. And we can see that the buildings nearest to 805 Don Mills range in height from 9 to 30 stories. In this slide, you can also see the ongoing construction of the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, which will be underground once it reaches Science Center Station. So next, we have a couple of street views of the existing conditions in the area. Here, we're looking southwest at 770 Don Mills, and we see the Science Center LRT Station building, which is under construction. The development on this site is proposed to the south and west of this building. This is the southeast view to 805 Don Mills, and here we see the site is currently a service parking lot, beyond which we see three residential towers ranging in height from 15 to 30 stories and the 22-story uh, Forester's Office building. So moving on to um, planning framework, the site falls within the boundaries of the Don Mills Crossing Secondary Plan, which forms part of the Toronto Official Plan. A secondary plan is a plan for a particular area of a municipality that provides more detailed policies than you might find in the broader official plan related to matters such as heights, densities, connections, parks, and urban design. Uh, 
prior to the adoption of the secondary plan and in order to inform the goals and policies of the plan city staff undertook a study in of the area from 2016 to 2019 uh, there were multiple components to this study, including a municipal servicing study, community services facility study, a transportation study, and a cultural heritage resource study, each of which had study boundaries well beyond the limits of the secondary plan area. Um, an integral compo component to any planning activity is community engagement, and as we heard from Annalie earlier, um, prior to the adoption of the Don Mills Crossing secondary plan, city by city council, over 1,100 people from local residents associations, community groups, and landowners were engaged to discuss the intended outcomes of the study, um, ask questions, and provide their feedback. So here we have the vision um, for the area that flowed from the study, which states that a distinct and complete community that celebrates the her natural heritage of the Don River Valley system and builds on the area's tradition of cultural and technological innovation to create a vibrant mixed use community, connect with nature and build resiliency, enhance mobility, choice, comfort and connectivity and support inclusive city building. So here we see some renderings of Eglinton Avenue that were created through the study. The Don Mills Crossing Secondary Plan was adopted by City Council in April of 2019 and came into full force and effect in December of 2020. New development proposed within the plan area is required to conform with the policies of this plan. So here, um, now I'll give you sort of a high level overview of the plan and some of the key policies that are relevant to these developments. The plan identifies character areas, land use designations, uh, public realm and street networks, densities and cultural and natural heritage features. The sites that we're talking about tonight are identified here by the yellow stars and they fall within the core area character area. The core area is the primary area of intensification within the secondary plan, given its proximity to the intersection of Don Mills Road and Eglinton Avenue East and therefore the forthcoming LRT station. Um, the plan states that tall buildings will be oriented to preserve sunlight on public areas such as streets and parks and provide appropriate transition to low scale uses beyond the secondary plan area. Developments in the core area will include a mix of uses, including residential, retail, employment, community uses, and will create a public realm designed to accommodate the movement of significant numbers of people. So on this slide, we see um, the land use designation and height maps that are part of the secondary plan with the sites highlighted in purple and yellow. Both sites are primarily designated mixed use areas which contemplate significant residential intensification combined with non-residential development. The Western end of 770 Don Mills and the Eastern end of 805 Don Mills are designated parks with public parkland permitted in these areas. The plan contemplates tall buildings on both sites with a mid-rise component permitted toward the eastern portion of 805 Don Mills to ensure um, that appropriate transition in height to the existing low density neighborhood in the Ferran Drive area. The tall building height permissions are at a maximum of 48 stories. However, the plan states that where sites can accommodate multiple towers, only one tower is to be permitted at the maximum height of 48 stories, with other towers on that site noticeably lower in order to create articulation and variability in the skyline. There are also minimum requirements for non-residential uses on both sites, and these uses could include retail, restaurant, office uses, as well as community uses such as daycare, schools, and community centers. Um, so this slide here is the public realm network plan for the entire secondary plan area um, with the sites highlighted in yellow. This map, uh, it identifies existing and new streets, trails, parks, and open, space, open spaces. The red arrows that you see here on the callout represent the intended locations of new public streets within each development site. And the large dotted arrow along the left side of this image is the ravine portal, which is a connected system of parks and trails. And it connects through the western edge of 770 Don Mills, creating better visual and physical connections with the adjacent ravine area in E.T. Seton Park. In addition to the policies of the official plan and the Don Mills Crossing secondary plan, a variety of guidelines will be used in the evaluation of this proposal, including um, guidelines for creating appropriate tall and mid-rise buildings, as well as creating family and pet appropriate residential buildings and units. Uh, in terms of public space design, guidelines related to privately owned public spaces and complete streets will be utilized. And in terms of environmental design, the Toronto Green Standard and Bird Friendly guidelines will be used. 
in order to implement the proposals, uh, amendments to the zoning bylaws are required as well as plans of subdivision. The subject sites are not currently part of the new Toronto zoning bylaw, so amendments are required to bring these sites into the bylaw. These sites are subject to the former North York zoning bylaw. However, 770 Don Mills is currently zoned semi-public open space, which is inconsistent with the mixed use areas land use designation. And 805 Don Mills currently forms part of a city owned right of way and therefore has no zoning permissions. So the amendments would provide for mixed use developments and establish appropriate performance standards related to density, building heights, massing, setbacks, parking rates, amenity areas, among many other provisions. The plans of subdivision are required to subdivide each site into the various development blocks, as well as create the new public streets and public parks. I will now pass it over to Jason Chen from CreateTO. Thank you, Michelle. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Jason Chen, and I am the project lead with CreateTO for the two sites that we are discussing tonight. We look forward to your feedback and input on the development concepts that are being presented. Uh, I'm just going to go over um, on this slide here a few of the key elements of the development before handing it over to our architect and our landscape architect, who will go over um, both of the site in both both of the sites in more detail. Um, so both of these sites comply with the Don Mills Crossing secondary plan policies that Michelle. Uh, just went over in order to support the plan's vision for complete communities. In terms of the first column that you're seeing here, um, in terms of the housing that's being provided, it truly is um, uh, mixed income. There will be a mix of tenures with a minimum of one third affordable rental, one third of market rental units, and a maximum of one third market condominium units that will be provided for both of the sites at 770 and 805 Don Mills. Um, the units will also comply with the city's growing up guidelines in order to provide larger family sized units, as well as include minimums for the amount of accessible units that will be provided. In terms of sustainability, it was mentioned like these are some of the guidelines that the development will follow. Um, this development will, will achieve as a minimum the tier two Toronto Green Standards requirements. In terms of the new public spaces, the middle, middle column here. Um, both of the sites will provide new public parks, new public streets, and improvements for the for pedestrians and cyclists in order to promote um, walking and cycling. And lastly, the developments will be providing new public facilities to really create a complete community. So, um, you know, Denzel Minimong, Deputy Mayor, he mentioned earlier um, some of the things that are being provided here. I think one of the the biggest and the most exciting is the new TDSB elementary school that will be incorporated into the site at 770 Don Mills. Both of the sites will also be providing um, new child care facilities, uh, as well as there will be new additional community use space at the 805 Don Mills site. And both sites will also include retail space provided at grade in order to provide uh, further community amenities. Um, these developments also, as mentioned, are, are just a prime example of transit-oriented developments that um, will help support the transit investment that has occurred with the Edmonton Crosstown LRT and the proposed Ontario line. So thank you. We are excited to be presenting to you tonight uh, our plans, and we look forward to your feedback. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, throw it over to uh, to Kevin from MSA. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for introducing me, Jason. So my name is Kevin Hutchinson. I'm an associate at Montgomery Seism Architects. We've been involved with these sites for quite a while, so we're excited to be sharing uh, what we've got on the table. Um, what you have on the screen here are is an aerial view from a similar angle that you saw before. Just to orient ourselves, the major intersection there is Don Mills and Eglinton. The area on the bottom right are the, are the former Celestica lands being redeveloped. We've shown that redevelopment for context so we can see kind of the fit of how these developments land. And what we'll do is we'll spend a few slides just looking at the overall, the big picture, uh, looking at 770 and 805 Don Mills together, and then we'll dive into each site uh, incrementally one after the other. Key piece we've been talking about is the delivery 
of new public spaces. So new streets, new public paths, pedestrian paths, parks, and other public spaces. So on the 770 side, there is there are two new streets. So there's Street A on the top right hand side, which is an extension of a street from the former Celestica lands, and then Street B, which terminates at Don Mills. On the 805 side, there is a new Street C, we are calling it, which runs from Don Mills to Ferran Drive. And there's also Ferran Drive being realigned to create a signalized intersection at Eglinton Avenue. In addition to those new streets, there are new public parks being proposed, so you can see those where those land now. So on the left-hand side, we've anchored the 805 side with a new public park closest to the low-rise neighborhood. And on the 770 side, we've anchored that side with a public park up against the ravine. In addition to those spaces, we've also got a series of mid-block paths. So there's connections to provide porosity through the developments, and each of those are terminated in some pop spaces, so privately owned public spaces. We've talked a little bit about the new community resources or assets that are coming to the site. So here we are depicting where they land exactly. We start at the 770, so that's the top right side. The new TBSB building is there. You can see it in the purple highlight. There is a daycare mid-block in the yellow highlight, a new retail frontage in blue. When we look at 805, there's a new community space up against Don Mills, so along the Don Mills frontage. There's retail frontage along Eglinton, and there is another daycare on the west side in the yellow highlight. And of course, the key third piece that these developments are pro uh, providing is new housing. So this is new affordable and market housing at transit stations. This has, has been discussed as a mix of market, uh, market condominium, market rental, and affordable rental. We've shown here in the yellow highlight where we've currently placed the market units, and in the red highlights are the affordable and market rental buildings. This slide, we're just going to reorient ourselves. So now we're looking exactly in the opposite direction here. What we're going to do in a minute is look at 770 in a little bit more detail. So we're looking back to Ravine and ETC and Park is to the bottom of the page. Before we dive into the details of 770, one last big picture item we want to cover is that contextual fit and the height of the towers. So these are two broad context elevations looking at the cluster of developments along Eglinton and Don Mills. What we see is a peak of those heights at the intersection of Don Mills and Eglinton at the maximum 48 stories, and then those heights taper down to the nearby development. So we just try to imagine like the peak of a tent that's at that intersection, and then we transition those heights downward to make sure we don't have any overly strong uh, or dramatic transitions. Okay, we're going to dive into 770. We're going to cover a few things. We'll first walk through what is in 770 in terms of the uses. Then we'll talk about how the plan is structured, and we'll take a little tour where we, where we walk around the outside and get a real sense of how the development lands at street level. A little bit more detail here so you can see in a little bit more granularity where all the different programs live. So again, the new daycare is that yellow frontage or orange frontage on Eglinton. Retail is in blue. The new TDSB building is in deep purple. And then of course, there is the new housing. So in this case, we're looking at 1,252 units are currently provided or proposed here. This is a site plan drawing of 770 Don Mills. So the, the road at the top of the page is Eglinton. You can see Street A and Street B hold the west and south boundaries of the development block, and Don Mills Road, Road holds the east side. There are really two key drivers here in terms of organizing the plan, that is the ravine on the west side and the transit station on the northeast. This is an open space plan. So here we're looking at mapping out and structuring all the things that aren't built, so all the public spaces uh, that need to be shaped carefully and well proportioned. The big drivers here again are a new public park on the west side, that's number six, and the transit plaza in the purple, which is number one. If we think of those as the two anchors, the key piece we're doing here is driving a new mid-block connection or a pedestrian path between those two. So you can move from the transit station to the ravine or from the ravine back to the transit station. 
Between those two things, the green areas, which are two, three, and four, are schoolyard spaces and daycare spaces, outdoor spaces. In terms of the frontages and what animates the ground floor, Don Mills and Eglinton have a particular character to them and a particular scale. So what we are planning is a fairly active urban character along Don Mills and Eglinton. So that would be composed of retail frontages, residential lobbies, the transit hub, and after hour functions or programs in the school building. The interior of the development would probably be more passive in character. So that would be uh, classroom spaces for the school building, the daycare yard, uh, and the indoor amenities for the residential buildings. Okay, this is the fun bit where we get to spin around and see what this all looks like a little bit more closely. So we're gonna do a little bit of a tour where we walk around the building. There are quite a few views, I'll try to, I'll try to go slowly. Um, so we're starting here, looking from the ravine back towards the intersection of Don Mills and Eglinton. One of the things that is a that is particularly difficult to manage, but has in fact offered us an opportunity, is the unique gradient on the site. So, of course, being close to the ravine edge, we have really significant topography changes to deal with. One of the great things about this, of course, for us, is that we can we've built a schoolyard up at an elevated level, and we've packed all of our parking, loading, waste services under the schoolyard. So, because the way Street A dips and Street B dips, we've got a great grade change there that we can work with positively. So that does some really good things for us and that it means we've isolated all those loading pickup drop off functions off of the street. So we end up with really tidy streetscapes. We're standing here on the north side of Eglinton, looking east back towards Don Mills. Eglinton Avenue is an extremely wide avenue. So one of the challenges we have is bringing some scale and proportion to that street. So we can see the base of the building, so the bottom part where we would call the podium is six stories here, so that's a, a fairly tall podium. We've also suggested that the ground floor be indented, so it's set back a little bit from the building above, so we can reduce the scale for people walking along the boulevard and provide good protected um, urban frontages for the retail and other uses. This is a view where we've slid a little bit further south on Street A, so we're standing kind of in the new public park, looking east back towards the development. In the middle of the image, you see a colonnaded walkway. That is the mid-block connection. So that's the, if you walk down that colonnade, you would end up at the station plaza. So that's the publicly accessible route. We call it the mid-block connection. On the right-hand side, just to the right of it, you can see there's a gentle ramp. It's got a bit of an orange glow to it. That is a ramp accessing up to the schoolyard. So that is a main access point for students and families accessing the schoolyard. And then further to the right, you can see Street A continues to dip as it bends to become Street B. An important part for us is creating really meaningful and supportive outdoor spaces. So while Don Mills and Eglinton are fairly coarse, urban, and they have significant transit infrastructure in them, creating a quieter inner realm is really important, particularly given the presence of the school and the daycare. So what we're looking to try to do here and what we're proposing is we think a fairly varied and active interior realm that is sunny and wind protected. And really what we want to do is create a good microclimate that encourages um, really good activity out into the shoulder seasons. And of course, being in the schoolyard, it'll be used even in the winter seasons as well. So the image on the left is of you standing in the mid block connection. In the center, you're standing looking in the schoolyard and the image on the right you're standing looking at the opposite end of the schoolyard, looking back out towards the ravine. The intersection of Don Mills and Eglinton is a little bit devoid of character for the time being, and that's largely because it's been under construction and realignment for so long. What we would like to do, the ultimate deliverable here, should be a much stronger sense of place. So in the center of that larger image is the recently constructed Science Center Station. We are looking at creating built form that shapes that space in a positive way and has some real strong landscape character. So when you arrive out of that station, you know exactly where you are. Okay, this is the last image to conclude the tour of 770 and then we'll switch to 805. But I think it's worth just recapping what is contained in that fairly compact envelope. So there, this proposal on 770 is 1,252 new units, a third of those being affordable rental. 
It's got a new public school and schoolyard, a new daycare, new retail frontages on Eglinton, a new public park, and two new public streets. So it's deliver delivering a fair bit on, its, on a highly constrained site. Okay, I think we are going to turn our attention to 805. So we just looked at 770, the one on the top right. We're going to start looking at 805. We will follow the same process where we look through first what is contained in a bit more detail and where that program lives. Uh, then we will look at what structures the development in terms of plan, and then we will go for a quick tour around the outside. So like 770, this site is also delivering a new daycare, kind of at the pointy tip of the lower building, that's the orange bit. It is also delivering new retail frontages in blue along Eglinton Avenue. This site is also providing new community space along the Don Mills frontage, so the lower two floors up along Don Mills. And it is providing, of course, new housing. In this case, we're currently showing 806 units, a third of those being affordable rental. Coming to the site plan drawing, just to orient ourselves for a second. Eglinton is at the top of the page. Don Mills at the left. A new street called Street C for the time being is at the south side of the development. And on the right side is Ferran Drive. We're showing the realigned Ferran Drive that creates a signalized intersection at Eglinton. There are three other pieces that really structure. Sorry if you don't mind going back for a second. There are three kind of key pieces here that we just want to highlight. Um, one is on the left hand side is the Ontario Line Elevated Guideway. So that is a piece of infrastructure plan to come through. There is a piece of land given over to let that be constructed that's on the far left hand side. Down the middle of the site is a new mid block connection. So the, between block one and block two, they are split by a path. And then on the right hand side, of course, is the public park. Now the next slide, thanks. This is a diagram illustrating some of those pedestrian connections as well as the outdoor spaces and their character. So right down the middle, you can see there's a yellow zone with a big orange arrow. That is a mid-block path and that aligns and works, uh, ties into the mid-block connection planned in the sonic condos to the south. So the idea would be that you can move from the south neighborhood right up through all these developments to get to Eglinton Avenue. Similarly, on the west-hand side, west, the left-hand side, um, the blue area labeled number one, the building is set back from the guideway to create a, a public space and to allow it to be integrated into the area under the guideway, ultimately. Like 770, the frontages on Don Mills and Eglinton are quite urban and coarse in their character, and Street C wants to be more residential in character. So to that end, we've got significant retail frontage along Eglinton. The community space is on the left-hand side. It stretches, it has frontage, in fact, on Eglinton, Don Mills, and Street C. Its entrance is on Street C. And then when we move to Street C itself, that frontage is very residential and smaller scale in character. So the residential amenity space, residential lobbies, and daycares front onto Street C. Okay, the tour. We're gonna start the tour looking from Don Mills. Maybe just a note here, in the pale blue, um, you are seeing a depiction or an illustration of the Ontario line. So this isn't final, this is a, for our purposes, drawing something so that we can see what the impacts are. I think there's probably other discussions to be had on the guideway, uh, but that will always be shown in the pale blue so you can see what it looks like. Two images here of that zone in terms of how we interface with the guideway. On the left, it's a more detailed elevation standing on Don Mills looking towards the building. Here, what we've tried to do is create a taller podium form. So we have a taller kind of mass up against the guideway. And at the lower level, we've indented and provided the community space. So the opportunity here is for the community space potentially even to spill out into some of that area and for the landscape to be integrated between our development proposal and the area under the guideway. So there's definitely an opportunity there for a more expansive public realm. These are a few snapshots of Street C. So Street C, when you move to the south side of the development, really wants to be more residential and smaller scale in character. 
what we've done here is we've proposed lower building heights on this side. So there's always a two story element rather than three, four or five. So always a smaller uh, massing on the south side. We've also shown these um, on street pickup drop off and tree line streets. So kind of complete streets with good generous sidewalks. And then thirdly, we've introduced these porch concepts. So as a way to expand some of that outdoor space into the building. So we can move from street, curbside street to through a garden to a porch into the building. This is an aerial view. Here we are kind of in the over top of Ferran Drive, looking to the Northwest. You can see street C curving its way as it runs into the new realigned Ferran Drive and some of those porches we were talking about. Here, I think the focus is on height transition. So our tallest tower at 48 stories, the second tower drops down to 26. So that's somewhat comparable to the Sonic condo. It's actually a little bit lower. And then the base of the building as we approach the park steps down yet again to four stories and two stories. So more comparable in scale to the church to the south of us. And then of course the public park uh, is proposed at that extreme east end. Got a few views here of the public park. It may also be worth another note here, which is to say we've shown a design for the public park that is illustrative and to help illustrate scale and potential, but the design of the park will ultimately be a separate process undertaken by a parks, forestry and recreation. And I think there's a separate consultation process, even for what might be in that park. Um, so this is, these are illustrations, but not, uh, not final in terms of the park design itself. The park, is quite lovely in that it has a gentle south slope and it's got three street frontages on Street C, Fran Drive, and Eglinton. And the backdrop to the park is the new daycare where you see those um, cherry blossom trees. I'm going to conclude the tour on this slide, I think. On the top left, we can see one last image of the mid block connection. So, this is looking south from Eglinton. If you were to walk down and follow those red maple trees, you would find yourself through the Sonic condominiums to the neighborhood to the south. The image on the right is, of course, the Eglinton frontage. So, we can see the building heights rising as we move towards the intersection. It's another good time to recap on what this development is delivering. So, this is currently showing 806 units, a third of them rental, uh, affordable rental, a new daycare, new community space, a new public park, new retail spaces on Eglinton, and new streets and a realigned Grand Drive. So again, quite a bit of public benefit here in a fairly small package. I don't think I have any last concluding remarks. Maybe I might pass it just on to Ying to cover landscape. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Wayne Giorgio, and I'm a principal at the Planning Partnership. I have about eight slides that I'm going to walk you through just to, um, to cover the landscaping. So um, on the next slide, uh, we'll start. So with respect to the landscape and building on everything that Kevin's just walked you through, um, the new streets, parks, and public spaces will do a number of things. So what, what they'll do is, number one, provide ample opportunity or greening and creating places for residents to walk, to enjoy outdoor activities, and to gather and socialize. Um, they'll also provide for two new city parks, as Kevin mentioned, and they're proposed at the east and west ends of the two developments. They will provide for two new streets, um, one, actually three new streets, the one on the left being the L-shaped A and B streets, that'll connect Eglinton to Don Mills Road, and on the right-hand side, a new street will connect Don Mills Road to Ferran Drive. These streets will have sidewalks. So if you go back to the last one, so um, these new streets will have sidewalks. Um, and uh, in the case of 770, include a multi-use path with trees and offer safe and comfortable options for pedestrians and cyclists to move through the sites as well as to connect to other places in the community. For example, while the Eglinton Avenue streetscape might feel quite unfriendly, uh, exposed to traffic today, which Kevin's already alluded to, it is planned to become a pedestrian friendly, tree lined and safer place to walk in the future. This means that a widened landscape sidewalk will be framed by buildings on one side and a row of trees on the other. This effectively introduces activity along the street and on the one side 
uh, and then separate pedestrians from traffic on the other. The images along the bottom of the slide are examples of the types of plantings and seeding and furnishings that would be used to create this type of streetscape. Uh, a similar type of uh, pedestrian friendly landscape treatment is planned along Don Mills Road. Here, along the east side of the street, landscaping will be coordinated with metro links and the lands that they've identified for the future elevated material line. I want to point out here that the elevated structure will provide the opportunity for metro links to create a unique, weather protected landscape plaza space that supports the activities around the station as well as the activities of, of the surrounding developments, including on the drive site. Along the west side of the street, the walk from the station to the Science Center will be along a widened sidewalk that's framed by trees once again on both sides. And additionally, spaces for seating and viewing activities are provided along the portion of the new building, uh, in particular where the school gymnasium is proposed. Uh, we mentioned that two new city parks will be provided on each site. The first is associated with 70, uh, 770 adjacent to the Don Valley. Here, uh, because of its proximity to the ravine and rules in place to protect the integrity of this natural feature, uh, the city park is expected to have a more natural character. This means a number of things, including, for example, naturalized plantings along the top of the valley, limited access to the valley edge to protect the vegetation that is there, as well as public safety. Additional plantings that enhance and augment the native plantings already there, and seeding and walking paths that allow passive enjoyment of the surrounding landscape and natural features. Uh, the second city park, as Kevin mentioned, will be located at the eastern end of the 805 property. As a complement to the more naturalized park on the west side, this park will be more urban in character. This means, for example, that it will have a slightly higher portion of paved surfaces and site furnishings to support a wider range of activities. The plan on this slide is a concept diagram to show a possible layout for the park. It's showing a central grass area, plantings around, uh, sorry, along the surrounding streets walkways connected to the sidewalks and larger paved areas for seating and gathering. Diagram, as Kevin mentioned, is not meant to be a detailed design nor final park program. That will come at a later stage in the development process and be led by the Parks, Recreation and Forestry Department. The mid-block connections on each site are publicly accessible walkways meant to make moving and getting around the community easier, safer and more enjoyable. On the 770 site, the west east west connection links the transit plaza at the corner of Clinton and Don Mills through the middle of the site to the new streets A and B, uh, where further connection to the ravine park will be from either the future signalized intersection at Eglinton or uh, a new controlled crossing mid block. This is yet to be confirmed. While the walkway path is fairly direct from one end to the other, it is planned to be made up of different spaces. Moving from east to west uh, on the slide right to left on the plan, the walkway is an open plaza adjacent to the transit station building, then goes under the colonnade of the building, then emerges onto an open landscape area next to the child care outdoor play area, then goes under another covered building area to finally emerge at the west end at a landscape plaza and views to the ravine park. It should be noted here that along the entirety of this path, there are continued views into the schoolyard to the south, albeit filtered through groupings of trees and shrubs. The mid-block connection on the 805 site provides a direct north-south link from Eglinton Avenue to the new public street identified as Street C, connecting to the developments to the south. This walkway makes use of the spaces between the two buildings on the two sites and is meant to be designed as a shared space. This means that while the space allows for pedestrian activity, seating and planting, it also accommodates access and servicing activities typical of taller buildings. The images on the left show examples of how paving and planting may be used to make the space both beautiful and functional. 
Uh, I'd like to end on this slide because the school is a very important community facility that will not only occupy a prominent place in the Don Mills Crossing core area, but will also bring life, vibrancy, and activity to this currently lifeless corner. Although the final design of the schoolyard will be done by the school board, the diagram on the slide shows how the schoolyard can fit seamlessly into the development and contribute to animating the space around it. It's showing a number of things. So the first thing it's showing is an undulating landscaped area along its north edge adjacent to the mid block walkway that creates a clear boundary between the two spaces while at the same time allowing visibility across the two. Showing an accessible ramp from the schoolyard down to the new street, the walls of which may be formed and softened by a series of cascading planters. Opportunity for pavement markings are at once playful and engaging and lastly berming in the air on ramp that capitalizes on the ramp clearance heights below to carve out an outdoor amphitheater or classroom area. Proximity of this new school site and schoolyard to the green system and park allows the TDSB to, fall, to further promote opportunities for nature interpretation and outdoor learning as part of its curricula. And on that note, um, I'll hand the presentation back to Jason. Thank you, Wai Ying. Um, I'll try to be brief so we can wrap this up and get to the discussion portion. So this is just a slide of our overall general timeline. So currently you can see um, we are right here in the summer at the consultation stage where we have our community consultation meeting tonight. And then we also have our design review panel meeting um, later this week where we will receive further feedback on the proposals. And uh, these meetings will then help inform our proposal so we can work towards um, our rezoning process. So that really is our next step. Uh, we anticipate the entire rezoning review and approvals process. It, it should take us up until early next year where we then plan to um, take it to the planning and housing committee as well as city council. Uh, we also plan to vote for our developer partner around the same time early next year. And this process is not a, a very quick process. It'll take, um, you know, approximately maybe five months or so. So that should take us about into the summer of 2022. And then once a developer partner is selected, you can see we would kind of be now into kind of the uh, mid latter part of 2022. Their next step would be to work on their site plan applications and their site plan approval process with the city. And we would anticipate that that would happen throughout the, um, throughout the end of 2022 and 2023. And then we would expect construction to start sometime in 2023. And then once construction starts, typically in normal developments, it takes about two to three years prior to having um, a first occupancy. So based on that construction start, we would currently anticipate somewhere for, for an occupancy around 2026. So once again, just a quick recap. So the main next steps are the design review panel meeting on Thursday this week for further feedback. Um, as mentioned earlier on, um, it is very important that we do receive any public feedback uh, by September 30th to be included in the community, community meeting summary. But just wanted to um, be clear that comments, however, can still be made at any time throughout the process by reaching out to Michelle Corcoran, who um, presented earlier on today. And um, her information will be included on the next slide. Uh, we'll then work towards um, finalizing all of our plans and reports um, based on the feedback we've received. And then we hope to be a planning and housing committee in early 2022, along with the developer partner selection process. So the last piece is just um, how to sign up and keep up to date on what's happening for these sites. So the first way you can do this is by completing the post meeting form. So just uh, how you'll get this is when uh, the meeting's over and you close your browser, something will pop up with this post meeting form where you can fill in all the information to keep um, to keep up to date and notified of what's happening on these two development sites. You can also sign up for updates online at www.createto.ca 
uh, forward slash housing now. And you can also, as mentioned, email community planning, Michelle Corcoran, you can see her email right there down, down at the bottom. If you don't have time to kind of jot that down, if you go to our um, housing now uh, site and click on the, um, the specific site for 770 and 805 Don Mills and click on the notice invite, you will also be able to get her contact information there later on if uh, you can't jot it down right now. Okay, I'll uh, take over from here. Thanks, Jason. Um, so what is going to happen right now is Matthew is going to promote everybody uh, to a panelist which basically means that um, every uh, participant uh, will have the same status as the project team member and will be able to control their own audio and video. Uh, you see um, our project team members, we would love to see your faces as well. Um, and there are few ways to participate. Um, so you can either turn on your camera and put your hand up. Uh, so um, I see you and I put you in the queue. You can raise hand virtually. Uh, just look at the icon with a little hand um, at the bottom if you're uh, if you're joining uh, by computer or if you're on your iPad or smartphone. It should be somewhere um, in the top right corner. And if you're on the phone, press star three, and then I'll see that you raised your hand um, on the phone, and I'll queue you up as well. So the, I'll, I'll create a queue and the queue will be running. So I'll tell you in advance uh, where you are in the queue and uh, um, who's speaking next. Um, other than that, just a few quick reminders. I, I know that was a long presentation and thank you for bearing with us. Um, again, to make sure we get to as many people as we can, please um, keep your comments, questions uh, that you'd like to share with us as well as the answers from the project team. Um, just under two minutes and try to be as concise as possible. Um, and I think that's it for me. So let's uh, go uh, to a presentation. Matthew, if you could promote everybody and then we can start lining people up, that'd be great. Okay. Let's see now if we can at the participants and who has it up. Oh, we'll give everyone a minute to orient themselves. Okay, we'll start with Ala. Hi, Ala, go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you for this presentation. It was very informative. Uh, my question is, um, is the did anybody conducted the study to understand how many subsidized units already exist in the in the area per capita? So basically per, per population which is already in the area. It seems like the area is already already um, south east corner is already heavily populated with the subsidized buildings and uh, adding additional um, uh, units. It might be a concern. Uh, I'm an owner who lives in uh, Sonic sub uh, Sonic uh, Towers, and um, just wanted to know uh, the percentage and what is allowed comparing to the other areas of the city, uh, and uh, that would be very helpful. Um, thank you, Ala. And uh, just to be clear before we answer your question, if you have any specific concerns that you'd like to share with us, maybe we could address those as well. Okay, so if I'm looking at the southeast corner where the a lot of subsidized or rental uh, apartments areas, uh, I would basically welcome anybody on this panel to look in the streets. There is a so, they are so dirty. There is so much garbage on those streets, and um, people just doesn't look like they care where they live, and uh, the, some of the streets have a particular smell and that's uh i don't know maybe use as a washroom i'm not sure but okay. i just I live yeah, I'll take it. yes i'll take it so this is going to be a high quality development um we do not zone for people 
we zone for uses and housing is a use. City Council has directed us to use this land for new affordable housing. As we mentioned at the beginning of this project, people across the city are in critical need of new affordable housing. People who uh, work in daycares, if you have a child, they might attend your child's daycare. Uh, people who may see you as a, as a receptionist at the dentist office. Uh, and so these people are looking for housing and are dealing with affordability crises like we've never seen in Toronto before. If there are issues re regarding the maintenance of other uh, apartment buildings in the area, um, that's something that we're interested to know about. It's not something that relates to the dis this development, but we might be able to um, put you in touch uh, with the right people or perhaps a uh, deputy mayor's office can also make a connection. I understand, but my question was with the study, with the percentage of subsidized units per, uh, per population in comparison to the other areas of the city. Um, we're not, uh, we're not looking at, a con we're not, looking at the project in terms of a concentration of subsidized housing. All housing serves people. And so um, we know that this project will be managed by uh, a developer partner to the city and they will be responsible for making sure that the, the development is well maintained and that will be in the agreement with the city. Um, we're, we're not looking at uh, location for other subsidized housing because we know that subsidized housing is critical to meet housing needs across the city. And that includes in this area in Flemington Park, uh, it includes areas across the city of Toronto in the Northeast, the downtown and in Scarborough as well. Hey, thanks, Ella. Um, we are going to move to uh, Catherine now. Catherine Mansop. Hi, uh, it's Catherine Manson. I'm the community development staff person for Don Valley Community Legal Services. I'm not a resident, but I've worked in the community for over 30 years. Um, my question is uh, community benefits agreements. Um, how is housing now going to create a community benefit agreement so that we connect and find jobs for our young people that live and work in Flemington Park and Don Valley community and employment opportunities uh, for people? Um, and the second question or concern I have is if the school is on the west side of Don Mills at 770 and you have uh, what's going to be the crosswalk concerns and safety of getting families to the school across from 805. If you've got an um, elevated highway, you've already got four to five lanes of traffic and you know people will cross before instead of walking up to the street corners. So those are two of my concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And um, I think maybe Salima, yeah, we'll go to you for the first question. Community benefits agreement. Hi, Catherine. My name is Salima Raji. I work with Creatio and I lead the Housing Now portfolio for Creatio. Um, thank you so much for your time today and for your question on community benefits agreements. We actually are doing um, work on across the portfolio of Housing Now on community benefits. Our sites, each one of them, uh, all 17, including the two that we dis are discussing tonight, will be subject to community benefit plans. Those plans will require the developers that come forward to participate in social procurement, as well as target 10% of the construction hours uh, on, the on the various construction pro projects, both at 805 and 770, to um, uh, communities uh, that require them, local communities, communities of color, uh, equity-seeking groups as well. Great, thank you, Salima. And uh, the question about um, the schoolyard and uh, quite a busy traffic flow nearby. Uh, Emily, do you want to take that? I think that's a really important concern. And um, I think one of the work that we'll do through what's called the site plan process, uh, which is where these big ideas get into really detailed design is, is confirming things related to uh, traffic, signal timing, etc. And the TDSB, I know we have a colleague on the phone from the TDSB, may seek other uh, other methods to uh, address the need for people's safety as they cross uh, as they cross Don Mills. I don't know, Anita, if you are able to speak to that. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, we will be looking to you to do studies that would ensure the safety and security of the children. Uh, attending the school from all directions. So again, as you say, it's uh, down the road, the detailed work. 
Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Anita. And Anita is from uh, TDSB here, um, in case anyone missed it. Um, okay, so uh, I have a few hands up. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Mark Richardson, then we're going to go to Jason, and then we're going to go to uh, M. Bossieri. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, great site, great development, transit oriented, affordable housing uh, in support of all of it. Um, I guess my, my questions are actually fairly specific to the school and, and uh, I know there's somebody from TDSB on. Is there anybody from Metrolinx who's on the call tonight as well? I know they have a call on Thursday this week about this intersection as well. Um, the size of the school is the school, you know, 54,000 square feet, I think, was the number that was used it when we were talking about this site in 2019. Is that still the same size that you guys have been working with or is COVID? changed your sizing requirements. Um, the this this is probably the first school in a podium that's been done anywhere in the city. There's a bunch of places that we're hoping to do this. So as much information as you can make available. Uh, there are other sites, non housing now sites that are interested in looking at this model. Um, and are the the phases of these two developments um, dependent on it's like are they dependent on the Ontario line has to finish its piers before you can start the stuff on the 805 side of the street or you TDSB has to get this school funded by the province before you can start on that tower like are there are there external dependencies that we need to start thinking about from a order of operations point of view? Okay, great. Um, three questions. Thank you, Mark. Um, so, well, actually, four questions. Um, size of the school, um, 2019, it was 5,400 square feet. Uh, is it still the same? I don't know, Jason or Kevin, do you guys? Jason, probably you would be better equipped to. Sure. That is still the number we are working towards. I think it's just a slightly larger right now, but um, we are working very closely with with Anita just to make sure, you know, and it's not so much the exact square footage, you know, what we're trying to aim at. It really is programmatic, right? So it's just making sure that we are achieving all of TDSB's requirements from a program level. And that's really our goal. It's not so much we need this number. It's does this school function for the needs of TDSB? Anita, do you want to add? Sure, and and I do work for the Toronto Lands Corporation and we are the agent and manager of the Toronto District School Board. Uh, Dan Costello is with us and he has confirmed, really, as Jason has said, the approximate size of the school is 54,000 square feet. It's really to serve approximately 550 students and they will range from JK to grade eight, the elementary level. And the outdoor area is the playground, as well as some podium space that was described in the overall design. Um, and are there any other examples um, of schools being done in a podium, uh, whether uh, it's a market ownership uh, or affordable housing that we can, that participants could look into? So urban school design is, is something that uh, across the city that we are looking at, and it is something that is prevalent uh, all over the world. Uh, there was an example in North Toronto at around the Young Eglinton area was designed some years ago that I believe that we're, most of us are familiar with. And we are looking at, as um, this gentleman has said, looking at other facilities that where we could incorporate where there are needs and there is a volunteer developer uh, with appropriate approvals to look at potentially a school to build a full community as we have in this situation. Great, thank you. And I think uh, Mark has also asked about any external factors that we uh, should be considering at this point to ensure that um, the school and the development in general proceeds uh, 
according to the timeline. So, you know, the Ontario line was mentioned, the, the construction of Ontario line or the funding for the TDSB school of the province. Um, Jason, do you want to speak to this? And then I'll come to you, uh, Anita. Sure, and I, I guess maybe Anita and uh, Metro can jump in if they wish, but um, just with, with respect to the Ontario line, there there is nothing that would be holding either of us up. Um, they're pretty independent of each other. One can go before or after the other. You know, one doesn't have to wait for the other to proceed. So with the Ontario line, there's nothing um, timeline-wise that we need to be aware of. But I should also note that we are um, in close contact with uh, with the Metrolinx team. They've been great. We've been having a, a great working relationship, keeping everyone uh, up to speed on what everyone's doing, as well as our timeline. So um it's been great and so far there's uh, no no concerns about timing with either or and same with the with anita and tdsb um we also are working together on um, a land exchange agreement on other properties so just from a, a timing or funding perspective that's all being worked out together between um tlc and uh, create TO in the city, and um, there, once again, there's nothing that would really hold up our, our schedule or, or our timing uh, for that project at 770 as well. Great, great, thanks. Anita, what about the funding for this school? Yeah, I think Jason's covered it. Uh, I don't think I have any further comments to that, but I know that TDSB is really looking forward to a new school in this area. Okay, great, thank you. Um, now we are going to go to Jason. Uh, Jason Hadi. Jason? Oh, Jason might be having some problems. Uh, Jason, we'll come back to you. Uh, we'll go to... Uh, uh, participant. Um, oh, and... hello. Oh, Jason. Oh, yes. Sorry. Hi. Okay. Sorry. Just IT troubles. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, great, informative. Um, I see that there's efforts to um, around the design for 805 to make sure that again the church matches with the park level and the Sonic condos match with the 20-ish story building. Um, but there's still a rather aggressive delta between the 45 story and uh, the 797 Don Mills building, which is approximately a 30 plus delta. Is the design amenable to making sure that the 797 uh, Don Mills story condo can, isn't aggressively bought in, or, or is the design amenable to making sure that, again, the, the, the delta isn't so large? I'll, I'll take that, Yulia, just to start. Um, Jason, the uh, plan that governs our heights here was adopted by City Council in 2019. Uh, through a very extensive public process and that pointed to a 48 story tower um, at the corner of Don Mills and Eglinton. So our goal here as we proceed with the design is to make sure that the um, that the quality at the street and in the lower levels of the building is complementary to what's happening south of the building and also of course to its east. And I don't know Kevin if you want to add anything to it. No, I think uh, I mean I think that we we are really leaning on the secondary plan, which tells us where to where to place height. Um, there is a really healthy separation distance between those two towers, so it doesn't doesn't we don't balk at it from our perspective. Okay, right. great, thank you. Um, we are going to a uh, participant by the name M Boasiri. Boasier. Hi. Yes. Can you Hi. hear me? Yeah, uh, yes, can. my name is Michelle Boisier. Sorry, I didn't put my first name. Um, I lived in the area for 15 years, and I really appreciate all the detail that you know this um, this committee has uh, presented today by the multiple presenters. I have two questions. Um, now that we're working remotely, a lot of people are working, you know, from home specifically. Um, as part of this assessment that you've done. What are some of the considerations for some of the resources, the infrastructure resources, including things like emergency services, police services, hospitals, um, to address the density that's being added to this area? And I consider the density being added to this area, not just the two buildings that were talked about this evening, but there's multiple uh, developments going on in the Banbury Don Mills area. 
but I would like, you know, certainly for this uh, to be considered and um, understand sort of how it's being considered as part of this particular plan. That's my first question. <laughs> and then the second question is really around um, um, I, sort of, I leave just east of sort of this development and um, we currently enjoy sort of a livability score of 88 um, out of 100 and, and our climate is fairly low. Increasing the density at this rate and of this sort of size, including all the other developments happening in the area. Um, what are some of the implications around sort of, you know, increased crime and things, things of that nature? I'm um, taking my assessment or the numbers that I got from the Toronto Police Service that was up on their site for 2020. I don't know if there are more current numbers or there's trending in that area, but I'm just looking at the density specifically, not necessarily sort of it being rental or anything like that. It's really just the density. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, so, first question about the relationship between density and, you know, some critical infrastructure, like including emergency services. How are you guys thinking about that? Emily? Um, Michelle, I don't know uh, if you want to jump in, but you're right, this area, uh, Michelle, you're right, this area is growing really fast. Um, we have the very large development at the former Celestica lands and the development that we're proposing. And of course, there are other developments further south down, down the Don Mills. And so I think um, what we what we need to talk about is what the province is directing us to do, which is to put people where transit investments are. So this is a key location citywide for uh, intensification. Um, that helps obviously with issues around citywide mobility, reducing car dependence and creating more environmentally sustainable developments, reducing the need for sprawl. But on a very local level, what that means if you need to call the ambulance, I, I think that's a, you know, a really important question to ask. And, and our divisions, Toronto Fire, uh, Emergency Services, Toronto Police, they're aware of all of the applications that come in. And when they do their service planning, they're taking into consideration the new population demands um, for all of these core city services. So, um, you know, it's not about a single development only. They're looking at the patterns of growth citywide. Um, so they will be circulated on these, the detail of these presentations. I think you had another uh, another question, Michelle. It was about density. I, um, in terms of crime, you know, the construction of new a new development on a parking lot is is generally a preferable kind of location in terms of having activity on the streets. We have uh, uses uh, directed at young people and children, for example, the new daycares, the new school, uh, there's new retail uses. So having more people circulate and have something to do creates that term, you know, eyes on the street, people are out and about. Um, there aren't the dark corners necessarily for crime to take place. Uh, so I, we're hoping that our design is something that uh, when it comes forward for this final site plan, uh, considers the details around sight lines, adequate lighting, um, and making sure that there are entrances and people can access uh, developments in safe places uh, and that, that aren't in shadow or otherwise. Can I, can I add something there um, in terms of the number of people and the densities? She's, you're right. I, there are as many as. Um, 21 new buildings planned for um, that area, and it is because of transit oriented development. Um, and so, uh, the 1 thing, actually, so, you know, because you're in a transit node, you are going to be able to travel more and you're supposed to get out of your car. Um, that's why they're allowing that density. The other thing that's happening as well is. <clears throat> the city is planning to build the largest community center in the city within walking distance, like a, a block away from you. Um, a huge, huge swimming pool and a smaller tank, a, a, a gymnasium, two ice rinks next to um, a two and a half acre park. So um, that and that's going to be brand spanking new, and it will probably finish um, pretty much the same time the, the development. Uh, it will probably allow, will 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 begin to be occupied. So, so so when you think of it. Um, Unlike a lot of developments in the city where condos go up and there and they're not a lot of um, there it's lacking in a lot of space, you're getting a brand new school in the neighborhood, right? Actually, in the development to serve the, the community, you're getting daycares, 
and you're getting the largest community center in the city, um, you know, right on your doorstep. So those are all positive things. But I hear you about the the density is really massive, and 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 I I don't blame you for being concerned about it. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I don't know. Before we move on, Michelle, uh, the planner, do you guys do you want to um, add anything? Like this probably has come up uh, as part of the sure. secondary plan. Sure, I'll just point out that recently through an, another application that's taking place in the area, we did actually do a scan of community uses um, to find if there were any service gaps in this area. And when it comes to emergency type services, there was interest raised by paramedics for the greater ward. Um, and so, you know, if they if they, that is something that they're interested in, they may look in this general area, but I think that they have a pretty broad catchment area. So um, while they had some interest in Ward 16 generally, I don't know that it was specific to this area, but that is something that we do look at. Uh, we do circulate, as Annalise said, to the emergency services, and um, we will circulate them when this application or this proposal is formally submitted. Just one other thing, the fire station is right down the street. Like, it's really close. It's at um, Les pretty much at Leslie and um, Eglinton. So if the fire department was needed, um, they'd be there like a split. Uh, I'll just um, I'll just conclude by actually uh, mentioning a process that CreateTO goes through on every project that we work on, particularly the housing out projects. There's a table at the city where all the divisions, including fire, including um, EMS, um, every division, childcare, services, parks and rec, all of the divisions sit at, and they see every opportunity that we bring forward and express interest in sites if, they're in, if they require a need and have been planning on doing new locations in those areas. So this, um, I, I know for sure that this went through that table and no interest was expressed. Otherwise, we would be having that discussion today about new locations um, with those types of uses. Great, thanks, Salima. Um, Okay, we have uh, Jason Ash, uh, Juan Rico, person, one person on the phone uh, put up their hand and Kay Lang in that order. Okay, Jason Ash, we are coming to you and I think I have to unmute you. Okay, Jason? yeah, thank you, uh, Yulia. Um, very quick comment. Um, I hope I'm not repeating anything anybody else has said before. Um, I joined the meeting a bit late, uh, so apologies for that. Um, Overall, I'm very excited um, about these two potential developments or actual developments. Um, it, you know, they're very compelling. Um, I think the community does have concerns, but I'm very confident they, they will be addressed and rectified. Um, I've lived in the neighborhood for, for a very long time, longer than I care to admit. Um, and what I would say is as an overall schema, if I'm coming down Don Mills Road, uh, coming south uh, towards the Eglinton Avenue intersection, I always view the south side of Don Mills Road as the gateway to Flemington Park. Um, you know, I know uh, some people say it's the gateway to the Ontario Science Centre. Uh, some people will say it's the gateway to the Valley. I think all of those things are part of Flemington Park and whether in a formal explicit way or an implied design way, um, I really hope that this development on both sides of the intersection recognizes and celebrates um, that when you're crossing the street, you are coming into Flemington Park. And that's my comment. Thanks so much. And we are happy to take it as a um, piece of advice. And this is exactly uh, the type of a comment that we're hoping to get. So um, thanks very much for this. Okay, Great. Juan Rico. Thank you, Julia. Um, thanks so much for all the uh, panelists. Great presentation. Uh, we definitely support the development of uh, 770 and 805. A uh, quick question. Uh, pretty much this is my thoughts and comments. In the last two, three years, with the development of the LRT right on the corner of Don Mills and Eglinton, and then the construction of the Sonic Towers, right, and the set of townhouses, the congestion for all the residents uh, getting out, trying to get into Don Mills between the hours, let's say 4 p.m. and 6 p.m., is crazy, right? Very, very busy. Thanks to the pandemic last year, uh, it, it was okay. But this year, uh, we see more people coming into the Foresters building. We see more uh, people coming into the 250 Ferron Drive, where we have the Intel building right there, a couple of offices extra. So good luck sometimes getting to make, trying to make the right turn. So probably a question for, I don't know, maybe Michelle or, or um, uh, the, the engineer, uh, Kevin, I believe. 
are you guys planning to change the traffic pattern for the corner of Ferran Drive and Eglinton even before the construction starts? The reason for that is because today uh, it is a one way. You are driving through Eglinton, you it's one way eastbound, and then you merge into Ferran Drive, right? Unfortunately, mm -hmm. some drivers, very responsible, and I will use that word, are driving the wrong way today. Just try to avoid the rush hour or at the corner of Eglinton. They drive the wrong way through the through the ramp and then merge into Eglinton, right? Uh, I'm putting myself in 2023, 2024, while well, all the construction, uh, all the workers, all the trucks, pickup trucks, right, deliveries are driving to that intersection being again only one way for them and for us as a residence, it's going to be a nightmare just to get out of Eglinton, just to merge into Dundas. Thank you so much and definitely we support the, the development for you guys. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much for the comments. Okay, so uh, I don't know, um, Anneli, do you want to speak maybe in general about how uh, you're thinking about traffic or congestion um, or Michelle? And then maybe we can go to this to talk specifically about Ferrari Drive and what are you guys thinking when you're thinking about implementing it? Sure. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about this Don Mills Crossing uh, planning secondary plan. Um, one thing that was a big part of that plan was all about mobility and there's a whole new street network that's coming um, and that Ferran Drive realignment is part of it. The core circle is what it's called and that basically enables people to legally uh, travel around the intersection of Don Mills and Eglinton uh, along Winford Drive through the new street that will be part of the Celestica redevelopment. Um, down on the other side of 770 and it's meant to uh, take off pressure, create more quiet routes for people who may be uh, walking their kids to school or cycling. Um, so that's kind of the long term build out. I'm going to pass your question about construction management, construction congestion over to uh, my colleague in community planning and Jason. So Michelle, do you want to go first and then we'll go to Jason. Um, sure. So, uh, as Annalise says, there are a number of new streets that are proposed through the whole development area and, and in particular on these two development sites. So, that will in part address uh, movement of traffic and again, the the realignment and, and the creation of a full moves intersection at Ferrand and Eglinton will assist with that as well. Um, my expectation is that those streets will be constructed prior to the developments. Jason, did you want to give us some for some information about the expected timing? Yeah, definitely, just in terms of uh, a timing perspective of, um, I guess, how things will proceed. The realignment of Ferran Drive will be the first thing that happens as part of the 805 Don Mills development. And, and you're right, that will really improve that intersection because Ferran Drive will then be realigned and it'll line up to make a full move intersection um, at Eglinton, Ferran, and Gervais to the north. So then you will be able as Annalie mentioned, to travel north, south, east, west um, at a normal signalized intersection. But that will only take place once the 805 Don Mills development starts. You know, it can't proceed or it won't proceed um, prior to kind of the development proceeding. So <clears throat> I think what was mentioned is, you know, can it happen now, let's say, or next year? It, it, it can't really happen. Uh, until the 805 Don Mills development and the Street C that we're proposing, the new public road is constructed along with Ferran Drive being realigned. So as mentioned, our construction timeline for, for the site is sometime in 2023, and that would be the first piece that would happen is the road work. And from just the construction management aspect, when we get to that um, point in time where we are discussing the details of construction, there will be a document called a construction management plan that is prepared by um, whenever the development proponents come on and they have a construction manager, they will work with them to create that document. And that document then gets reviewed by and circulated through city staff to ensure there's minimal impact uh, on the surrounding neighborhood. So that document gets reviewed and approved um, by the city just to ensure that um, their construction management plan um, will reduce any sort of impact to the community. Great, thanks. And I mean, we hear you loud and clear, density uh, and addition of many people and cars, congestion, traffic flow is a 
is a big consideration for this area. And this is something that we need to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, okay, we are going to go to a calling user right now. Uh, you will hear that you're unmuted right now. So, hi, go ahead. Hi, my name is Diana. Hi, Diana. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Thanks for the presentation and all the good information that you're sharing. Um, somebody, I think, was covering my question and had to do with the, with the height of the buildings. And one of the slides was interesting. It kind of showed a wave to compare the height of the proposed buildings to the current ones. Um, because I am in a building that's about 15 stories, and right in front of me is going to be one that's three times the size of the one that I'm currently in. I was just curious, how do you come up with that rendering? Like, because, sorry, and I wish I took down the number of the slide, but I, I just don't understand how it's shown as a smooth wave when it's three times the size of one that I'm currently in. How does that work? Okay, thank you. I think uh, the question is, um, you know, what are you guided by when you think about the heights and transitions and what is considered appropriate for this area? No, Anita speaking. Hi. Hi, Anita. I'm going to mute you. Um, okay. And um, I don't know, Kevin, do you want to uh, take a yeah, I think it? I think I can. So when we are looking from our perspective, when we're looking at the massing and contextual fit, there's a there's a bunch of different scales we are looking at. So those diagrams you're referring to look at the whole cluster of towers, not a tower by tower. So overall, the kind of profile is tallest at the intersection and then it moves down. But I think uh, somebody else previously mentioned the same kind of height transition concern about immediately to the south, um, uh, that there's there's at the more micro level that, that height transition is a little bit more stark from 17 up to 48. I think that's that may be a takeaway for us. There may be some moves we can make in terms of the mass of that tower, so we end up with some more kind of resonant massing to help transition a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, the heights really are governed by the secondary plan that tells us what heights we can put where, uh, and that corner is identified for forty-eight stories. Thanks, Kevin. And can, Michelle, can I? Do you want to... Yes. Do you want to add? Yeah, yeah, because I, I have seen the development of the sonic towers. They're literally bes beside me. And I'm just, um, you know, I've, I've actually filmed the, the shadow that's cast at different points of the day because I'm, I'm, I'm looking north. And it, they literally go across the intersection. So I just get concerned with on each corner, even across the street, I think with the Aspen on the south side where Celestic is. By the time you put in all these towers, how much natural sunlight? I know we're trying to create natural spaces and the, the rendering show trees, but just with the two towers, it casts a lot of shade. And now I'm thinking throughout the day, how much natural sunlight is there going to be for these families and for a healthy development of people and for the growth of the natural spaces? When you have something that's 48 floors high, um, the ones beside me are just 30 stories, I think you said? And, and it's I, quite. Um, so I can jump in. I think you know that's a you know, that's a question we hear across the entire city when it comes to families living in tall buildings, and it's something that the city has taken a lot of time to think about. There is a new um, there's a new approach to looking at how tall buildings are designed. We're thinking of them as vertical communities because if you think about an old subdivision from many many years ago the number of units that may have been in a subdivision like that actually are the same number that we're proposing for example in 805 don mills or 770 don mills so we're really thinking about things as vertical communities making sure that we have units that are size that are larger so that families or or larger households can be comfortable living in these new buildings amenity spaces that are right next to open spaces uh, for use by the building uh, and we have our guidelines related to tall buildings, which ensures um, which ensures a separation distance of a minimum of 25 meters between them. So we can't deny the fact that the city is growing, that the city is growing upwards, but we have levers and ways to deal with the design of tall buildings so that they are livable in the long term. Um, I know that doesn't necessarily address your concern, but the fact is uh, we are directed to get height and density in this area. And so what our job is to do is to make sure that the actual developments are as livable as possible. Um, 
I hope that helps a little bit with your your question, but I, I see the root of your concern and I, I understand your point. Yeah, and, and to add to um, Annalie, uh, what we can do is we can document that this concern has been shared and it's part of the public record. So in that sense, it's helpful um, just to be aware of, you know, what, what the community is sharing. So thanks for this. And I, and if I can just add, um, you know, Annalise, you know, our discussions are, are, are a lot centered around the fact that the secondary plan permits certain heights and certain densities, but the secondary plan also provides guidance on um, ensuring that public spaces, public sidewalks, public parks are not overly shadowed. And to that end, we have certain specific policies that, that sort of limit how much shadow these new buildings can um, cast in different parts of the secondary plan area. And in addition to that, we have other guidelines that we're utilizing that I mentioned in my portion of the plan, of the presentation without getting into detail that talk about trying to keep these vertical communities um, in slender buildings so that we're minimizing not only the shadow that they cast, but the views that we enjoy to the sky, um, whether that be from inside of our own units or out while we're walking down the street or out of park. So it is something that we're very aware of and that we do, um, it does play into the, the design of the buildings. Great. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, we are going to move on to a participant um, under Kay Lum. Um, and then we're going to go to Julia Stelmach and another uh, participant on the phone. Hi. Uh, Hello? Yes. Hello? Oh, okay. Um, I've been in this area since since I was two years old. And I've noticed that neither Farmington Park south of the site, nor Don Mills north of the site, nor Winter Concord east of the site, nor, nor even Lee side west of the site. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm I'm gonna intervene okay. a little bit. Uh we have trouble hearing you. It sounds like uh maybe uh your headphones are uh in the way or maybe there's something else going on in the background. Can you um, try? Is this better? Hello? Hello? It's slightly better. Okay, let's try. Let's try. Let's okay, sorry. tell us tell us what you want to share with us. Okay, um, I've lived in this neighborhood since I was two years old, and it's been my observation that the existing law calls for ten-story towers whenever they're beside major streets, and where there's exceptions, they've been well back from the street, just like Sonic, or the twenty-story buildings in Huntington. Um, Winford Concord, or even North and Don Mills. Um, the thing about tall buildings is they create wind problems for people, and the street is really busy. It's a main intersection. Um, there isn't even a design for a bridge across the, the intersection so that pedestrians don't need to wait for lights and so that cars don't need to stop. Um, that happens a lot in Scandinavia, where they actually have over cyclists in the live streams. It's not in the design. Another thing I noticed is that since the only school possible is inside the building itself, it, it seems like there's, if there's not even space for a separate school building, that shows that it's far too dense for any neighborhood, north, south, west, or east. Of it. This is more like something on Young Street where there's an actual subway, but the LRT only carries four times less capacity. This doesn't seem appropriate here. I mean, the spacing is great. The tower spacing is nice. From above, the plans are beautiful. But okay. the, fact that, the, the fact that you need a to cut down the wind from the height of the towers, and the fact that, that your renderings straight up make, the build, make three of the five buildings that are taller than 30 stories too tall. I think I agree with all the other callers in, uh, in the, the Okay, system. thank you. I mean, sorry, we, we, we had a bit of a trouble hearing you and I think you have a lot of good comments. So uh, we, it might be useful if you also follow up with your comments in an email to us after that. Um, yeah, because we, we heard maybe half of it, but uh, let me try. I think one of your, um, one of your comments or concerns is about um, the heights of the buildings. Um, and then another concern is about uh, the school, the urban school approach and uh, how much space there is for the school within this urban setting. 
Um, and uh, there was also a comment regarding um, the LRT um, and the capacity of the LRT and how that relates uh, to the development here and the density that is being brought. Um, I might not have gotten all of it or some of it might not be right, but uh, please email us uh, with, with additional comments before. So let's try to address what we've heard. Okay, so again, another comment about the heights and that um, the buildings might be too tall and not appropriate. And I heard, um, I heard the participants say maybe 10 story buildings come to mind. Um, I think we heard that loud and clear. So we're gonna document this. Um, so the approach to urban schools and whether that's en enough space in that setting for a school, um, I don't know. Uh, I know Anita is still here. I, I, Anita, if you would like to address that and how um, TDSB is thinking about urban schools in general. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. I too had some trouble listening to um, the, the caller. Um, the TDSB has various uh, approvals and resolutions that a school in an urban school in an accommodate in a tower is something that they are looking at as an alternative to a standalone site. So they have done a number of uh, studies themselves and I'm happy if the caller wants to give me the information to pass along to the TDSB contact to provide further resolution and information so we can get details on that. And I think the other question again related to the space in the urban school, which I believe we talked about before, uh, to serve 550 students and approximately 54, 55,000 square feet. And as Jason has pointed out, it's really to make sure the school fits uh, for the students that are there. So the numbers are approximate. Okay, great. I think there was also um, a comment about the impact of wind of to on tall buildings um, and- um... So, sure, I can, I can just point out that um, in addition to our, our policy speaking to minimizing shadows, uh, they also speak to minis minimizing, <clears throat> excuse me, wind conditions, um, both on the site that's being developed and in the neighboring properties. So um, to that end, there will be um, pedestrian level wind studies that will be provided um, as we move through these proposals and we move through the rezoning um, process. So um, also something that, that we are aware of and that we are, um, very, um, we take a very close look at when we're considering these tall buildings. Good, thank you. Um, I know we're almost at time and we started five minutes late, so I suggest uh, we go five minutes late. Um, I will go to a call-in user on the phone right now. You will hear that you are being unmuted um, and then you can go ahead. Hello, can you hear us? Uh, yes, hi there, <clears throat> good, uh, good evening. Uh, good, great presentation overall, I believe. Uh, I just have a quick question. With, if the salary change is for a tenant to be above 68,000 cap during their occupancy, will that change the tenant's uh, eligibility in maintaining their residence? And, and further, how fixed is the salary range as we're facing inflation and increases in the cost of living? Thank you. Great, thank you so much for these questions, Valessa. I think uh, it's over to you. Can you hear us, Valessa? Hi, Yulia. Sorry, my my audio cut out at the end. Can you can you please repeat the question? Yes, uh, two questions really. So. Um, uh, will the eligibility uh, of the tenants change if their salary or the income goes up? And how fixed are you looking at the range uh, for uh, affordable housing in terms of income, given that you know we're facing inflation and other external factors that make it more difficult to afford anything? Well, th so thank you, for, thank you for the question. So in terms of, of the first question, um, to qualify for affordable units, there is initial um, income testing. So income is not uh, not tested annually. There's just initial um, income testing to qualify for an affordable unit. So in the city of Toronto, um, an affordable unit is a unit that's rented at 100% of 
or below of the average market rent. And average market rent is set annually by CMHC. So each November, CMHC sets um, the rent thresholds. Um, and that takes into account rents in, in all areas across the city. So for instance, currently the average market rent for a one bedroom unit is $1,431, so $1,431 per month. Um, in terms of, this is, sorry, what was the second part of the question, Julia? Really? Like how, so, okay, uh, how, how fixed are you looking at the range uh, for eligibility? And from what you just said, I understand you're following the TCHC kind of standards, right? No, that's no, no. So this is not okay. really geared to income housing. This is affordable housing. So to qualify for affordable housing, um, there is the, the threshold that was shown in the presentation. So currently it's about 50,000 um, a year. So essentially your income cannot be more than five, more than four times um, the rent, if that makes sense. So and that's on an annualized basis. I think you really, the other part of the question was around what happens on an annual basis and the income threshold does change on an annual basis and Valessa's team works to update that uh, on an annual basis. So the question, the question, the concern on the question around as we go through inflation and the costs are rising, will that income threshold change? And the answer would be yes. And what happens, um, sorry, and maybe the first question, Valessa, like what happens if you are, um, you are uh, in the program for affordable housing, you're renting affordable housing unit, and then your income changes, and which puts you over the cap. Um, so what happens then, if I understand well? So it's, as I mentioned before, it's um, income is tested upon initial occupancy only. So there isn't, there isn't an annual testing. You don't have to requalify annually like you, like people um, who are in a rent care to income unit, for instance, um, have to. Great. Um, thanks so much for this. Um, let me see if we have anyone else in the queue. It would be the last hand, which is perfect because we are right on time. Um, so, uh, for any closing remarks, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, the counselor. Counselor. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for, um, oops, am I there? There I am. Thank everyone for attending. Um, uh, it was a long meeting. Uh, there were lots of questions. Um. I think so. That the, there, there's going to be an apple, a rezoning application that has to be filed with the city. Um, I actually did have a question because this is an unusual arrangement. Will there be a preliminary application filed, or has that already been done? There's no preliminary report. It will just be the um, the application. So th this is the public meeting, then, right? Yes, yes, it is a public meeting, and we're we're using really the, all the work also that went into the Don Mills Crossing plan and all the pub public meetings as kind of background Not for the, this as well. Yeah, but still, if any private developer, they'd still have to go through a pre-app. And have yeah, this is the public. This is the public meeting for the site. Okay. Um, look at. Uh, I'm listening very carefully to everything you have to say. Um, you know. Me, I'm not just writing that down and making a note of it. I'm actually listening and hearing what you have to say. So I don't want you to think that you know they're just going to make a note of this and then file it off. Um, that's kind of that's not the right approach that I believe in. Um, I think that we need to look, take your comments seriously and interpret them and, and see if we can take some of your comments um, and make some changes based on that. Um, this isn't just a, I don't want to, I don't want you to think this is a rubber stamp process and that we're just going to, you know, forget about all the comments, but it's just, and it's just going to be put in, it's going to just put in a file and forgotten. That's not true. We're going to look at it. We're going to think about it and, um, and I've made notes of your comments. And if there are any changes that we can make, um, we will. I mean, the real challenge on this, especially on the height and density, is on this cor this corner. This corner was made to be higher um, because there, you know, it, it is the intersection of two transit corridors. So it will 
it will take a certain amount of density. But um, this process is, and the way the planning process is supposed to work, it's supposed to be a, a process where we take your comments um, and we thoughtfully go back and we see if we can reflect your comments in a better proposal. Um, and that's what I hope that this process has done. Um, you can continue to, you know, provide your feedback to create TO, or you can contact my office and uh, I can see if we can uh, noodle through some of the problems that you have. But uh, they're good questions. Um, you know, all these folks here, um, they're, they're really good at what they do. Um, you know, you've got architects and landscape architects and transportation planners and this person and that person. But the, the, where, the, where they don't have experience is they don't live in the community. And that's, why, that's where you come in. And that's what, where this process is so critical to um, actually making a better development. So um, it's been a long evening. I just once again wanted to thank you. And um, please stay in touch with me and uh, the folks uh, with CreateTO. And um, we'll, uh, we'll try and uh, move this application forward um, and make it better. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and on that note, uh, our team will do a draft um, summary of what we've heard today, and we will share with um, all the participants today in draft before we finalize it to make sure that what we've documented um, is captured accurately. Um, and uh, before before it becomes a public document that lives um, on Creatio's website. Uh, with that. Uh, Jason, Annalie, would you like to say a few words? Good. Annalie is good. Jason is good. So thank you very much for participating um, and uh, more to come from us. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.